Welcome to this very exciting uh, Civilizations in Review. I am uh, so much looking forward to chatting about this seemingly a little bit more well-known empire, and then we'll jump into the uh, mysteries and details about it all. But thank you again, Emily Schultes, uh, live, living in all the way from the Netherlands today. So thank you for staying up so late and engaging with us. Um, and for those, this is Thursday. I know it's not our normal day, but uh, so much incredible empires to learn. So let's jump into it. Um, as a reminder, this will be on our YouTube, our Instagram, our website, our Spotify, and obviously here on our Facebook. So you can learn all about the empire and rewatch the cool things that we're all about to talk about. Uh, again, thank you again to uh, Emily for being here. Uh, I'm going to throw it to Nico to read her 101 word introduction. Perfect. Um, so located within the fertile valleys between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the Seleucid Empire reigned from 312 to 64 BCE. The Seleucid Empire was carved out from the remnants of Alexander the Great's Macedonian Empire in an area known as Mesopotamia or modern day Iraq, uh, Kuwait, Turkey, and Syria. It was a multinational empire founded by uh, Seleucus I, uh, who harmoniously blended Middle Eastern culture with Hellenistic culture. Uh, for nearly 300 years, the empire was marked by the, its uh, religious tolerance, profitable trade tactics, skillful bureaucracy, and military strength. This allowed the Seleucid civilization to become a lasting and forceful power in the region. Well said. <laughs> well written. Uh, Let, let's jump in with, with uh, what, what made you choose this, this really fascinating empire, first and foremost, of the list of 75 that we have. <laughs> yeah, so I honestly chose the Seleucid Empire, uh, honestly, out of no reason other than that I had never heard of them before, uh, regardless of the fact that they were such a big empire and they existed around the times of the, the Romans and everything. I was just quite surprised that I'd never heard of them. And um, yeah, I thought they were uh, quite interesting. And the more I started looking them up, the more I realized how famous this civilization was. And uh, as well, like it's quite interesting because the Seleucid Empire was the out of the Macedonia, uh, out of Alexander the Great's like kingdom that he had. Um, it was the big, once he died, it was the biggest king uh, empire to have come out of that. So I thought that was quite interesting as well. So yeah, that is why I chose Seleucid Empire. So a lot of different empires start with, you know, big battle or, you know, pivotal and important figure. And I'm curious to hear a little bit more about uh, who Seleucus was and what, and about a story and uh, even, you know, the Battle of Gaza. Okay. Yeah. So uh, like I said, it, like when Alexander the Great was uh, alive and thriving in his kingdom, uh, after he died, it kind of left this like power vacuum where then it, it was a question of who was going to come to power and who was going to claim authority. So anyway, there was five of his, I believe it was five of his top generals that kind of all started fighting for power in the region. And of course, because this region was so profitable and trade with, with both of the rivers and the river systems and everything. And it was just a massive region to control. So there was five people who fought over the power for this. And eventually Se Seleucus uh, was one um, and Seleucus the first. So he was the one that first rose to power and kind of at the Battle of Gaza was able to defeat them and the other generals and then he was able to claim his territory which was quite small at the time but then eventually as he gained more supporters and built his military up he was kind of able to expand um, eastward and then once he expanded eastward he kind of got to towards where we would now say is modern day Pakistan and India and he kind of got to these regions um, and where he eventually started battling against the Mar Marian Empire, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, so yeah, yeah, he was, uh, I mean, it started with a victorious battle of Gaza, but it was only until like a few hundred years later that he was actually able to conquer the massive amounts of territory that he did. And uh, then once he did conquer all of these, he had to have in place like uh, different autonomies uh, kind of like pr provinces it, within his empire because uh, I found that there was between 50 to 60 million people that lived within this empire so it's just it's massive and like I said uh, or like you said uh, it's what now consists of Iraq, Kuwait, Turkey and Syria so I mean these are 
that's an insane amount of land to try to control with one one person and one empire and one government so he had to kind of decentralize his rule and therefore put in to place provinces but his power was always being contested with the romans and the more you had the romans on the west and the Mauryan empire which was kind of like the where india is uh on the east side but um but yeah i don't know if I, yeah but luckily they were like he was able to kind of forge a uh, alliance with the Indian Mauryan uh, Empire um, and this was able to facilitate kind of at least an easy east side border uh, not so much the west side but uh, yeah so it was kind of able to then he was able to hold his power for such a long time. Wow uh, a lot of our empires kind of start the similar way or not ours the ones that have been written on we've talked about um, a very similar way to the Seleucid Empire has begun. So that's interesting to know that's kind of how it works. Get off the heels of a very big empire and win your first battle. And more or less, you will have a fruitful, fruitful reign. Um, I'm fascinated to sort of hear this uh, trade between the Romans and the Mauryans, you know, Roman in the Mediterranean, you know, West part, and the Mauryans in the Indian part, and there's sort of that belt, so to speak, connecting them. Um, was there a, a Persian Empire as well that they were connected to, or was it really just those two and Seleucid was that link? Yeah, there was the Persian Empire as well. And as well, they, they had a lot of co contestation from where Egypt is now um, with the, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this correctly, the Ptolemy? Ptolemy, yes. Um, so that was another, they had a few battles with them as well. So they were being more heavily contested in their west and south. Um, and then as well, not even with that, but within their own region, they were having a lot of battles because actually um, like the Seleucid Empire was quite well known for their like blending of cultures. So of course, when, when Alexander the Great uh, passed away and then this new empire erupted, you had, and you had traditionally like a Greek culture, but then as they kept expanding or Macedonian Greek culture, but as they kept expanding, they kind of got into as I said, the Mauryan Empire territory. And as they were taking these societies under their reign, they were becoming Arab influence as well. And so because of this, um, and with all the people that they ruled and all the territory, they had to be quite flexible and um, tolerant of other cultures and religious practices. So every every province was allowed to have their own um, their own uh, temple and their own kind of governing system and their own religious beliefs and all these things but then that wasn't unfortunately passed down through all of the leaders so then after Seleucus died and then there was uh, his son in power and then after I think it was Antiochus uh, four, the fourth uh, he was not tolerant of other religions so he kind of came into this and he started to um, interfere in people's lives and say that everyone had to adopt, uh, had to worship the Greek gods. And this erupt, this led a huge uh, revolt uh, near where is now Jerusalem. Um, and it led to like, a it's called the Maccabean uh, revolt or revolution. And uh, this was because of this. So he started putting his foot down with uh, accepting of different religions and everything. But the re reason that they were able to exist for so long was because of their military power, their alliance with the Mauryan Empire, but as well just their accepting acceptance of the people that even lived under their empire until Antiochus IV. <laughs> so. No, and it's really interesting, the, the story of the Maccabees, especially in that, um, and the revolt that happened there uh, and how that led to the overall uh, disintegration of the empire uh, is a really interesting story. And I'd love to hear you kind of elaborate on that. Uh, so from what I read, um, this started off a cascade of different uh, secession movements throughout the empire. Um, was this traced uh, entirely to what happened in Judea, or did this more have to do with uh, the, you know, dissolution of the tolerance that once defined the empire? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there was, there was kind of a few reasons why it all broke down. So 
yeah, you had the Romans were always, you know, looking to further expand. So you had the Romans that were trying to expand and grab more territory um, in from the Seleucids. And then you also had the Platomies uh, trying to grab uh, what they could from the Euphrates River, um, since this was such an important like um, river system that the, the, the Seleucid Empire had. Um, but then you also had like the national component to it, where when a lot of the times when the Seleucid, the Seleucid Empire were losing battles, they were actually forced to have pay uh, reparations towards uh, the Romans. And actually, after this happened, a lot of the autonomy that was like existing within the empire. So people, I mean, it seemed to work for them. People were able to coexist and do their do their own thing in their own autonomy, uh, their own provinces. But then as they were losing wars against the Romans who were uh, like up and coming and super strong, um, they had to, they were forced to pay uh, reparations. And in this sense, they had to demand all the provinces to higher the taxes. And when this happened, people weren't very happy with this. They were, they liked their freedom. And now with higher taxes, this was gonna cause kind of national strife. And then moreover, when Antiochus came, the fourth came into power and the Maccabean revolt, things just kind of started now, not only on the peripheral, but nationally kind of just started falling apart. And, um, and yeah, you know, even though they were blending these cultures and they were very tolerant, it was only a matter of time before some cultures felt that they weren't being properly represented, um, especially the the Greeks were thought to be more of the aristocrats. They were involved in all of the, the politics and everything because it was traditionally uh, marked and governed by Greeks. And then the Arabs were kind of seen as, as the peasants. So this, of course, also sparked a lot of national yeah, contestation between the states and individuals and everything. And eventually, you know, even if your borders are strong and your military is strong, if you don't have that, if you don't have all of the people behind you, people will want to secede. And that's exactly what happened. So people started want to secede, uh, wanting to secede. They just didn't agree with, with the practices and the tax, the taxation and yeah. Wow. Um, it's interesting because there's a lot of through lines to a lot of other empires, basically exactly what you said. The uh, relative tolerance and inclusion of different religious or minority or ethnic, linguistic, whatever communities still will lead to an empire's downfall no matter how uh, intentional and, and tolerant and coexistent they are. It, it seems like that's a crux of, of every empire, no, no matter really what happens as a, a lot of empires fall for, you know, scattering their lands or multi-front battles or whatnot. It looks like this also happened with Seleucids. Um, I think it's really interesting too, the, the, I don't know, holding that land for 300 years is in of itself very impressive, but, but sort of the, really, it sounds like they were more of an intermediary in a sense between the Greeks and the Maurin instead of being their own empire. Is that, am I getting uh, the wrong sense from that? Or is that kind of accurate? No, I'd say that's kind of accurate because the Seleucid empire, they weren't necessarily like, you know, known for some, uh, I don't know, some very strong position. Like the Romans were known for their military might. And the Mauryan Empire, they were also known for the rich traditional values. And it's kind of like the Seleucid Empire was kind of like this, this, uh, this region that kind of kept the peace almost a little bit between the two, where they were able to kind of forge relations with the Mauryan Empire. And then as well, they, well, they weren't, they ended up getting defeated by the Romans, but it was kind of this buffer zone, I guess you'd say, between the, the two contesting powers. And uh, yeah, I think they're mainly marked by like, like I said, being quite tolerant and being quite more or less a peaceful um, empire. I mean, not completely, but they weren't known for so many revolts and uprisings as others. And they, and yeah, so they weren't marked by anything that was, um, yeah, that you could really identify them by. So I think in that sense, yeah, I think they were quite just this like medium kind of buffer zone between the two zones. So. But yeah. And, you know, from the sound of it too, it was really decentralized and how it was run, uh, but did a lot of the kind of cultural one that happened, would you, would you say trade was kind of the 
strongest force that allowed that was trade safe within the empire? Uh, did it create this degree of cohesion between different cities that lied within its borders? Um, to what degree did, you know, uh, trade or other factors really unify the empire? Was trade the big unifying factor or was that Hellenistic order that encompassed, you know, all of its borders also uh, unifying to a degree? Yeah, so definitely. I mean, uh, just having that river system, the Euphrates and the Tigris, like ha just having those two was able to provide such economic relief for all of them, uh, for, for the entire empire. But it was also able, uh, like you said, it was also able to kind of forge relations and, and kind of a social identity, I guess, um, when you're trading and when you're eating kind of similar foods and, and things, you kind of, you start to form communities. And so so even though there were provinces, uh, like in a way, it still was one empire identity in a way. Um, and as well, yeah, the, the trade was, was huge. I mean, they were with the two river systems, they were able to, they were able to dry farm because of the, like the natural heat and everything that existed in that area, but as well. So if they were, if they're far away from the river system, they were able to um, actually make underwater like channels that were pulling water from the river system. So this enabled people that were even in these drier climates without, without access to the rivers to still be able to pull water from the under uh, water network system. And then people that obviously lived by the river had the, benefit of not only having water right there but as well being able to travel up and down from the water system so that in itself it enabled communities to kind of move to communicate with one another to move provinces to channel their their economic system and yeah so it, it definitely influenced culture and uh, the economics and everything and um yeah they they would make things such as like olives and um yeah, uh, all, yeah, uh, cheese from goats. So they they made a lot of the food that we would consider to be Mediterranean today, um, and yeah, and and as well, yeah. I wanted to, you asked about also if it was kind of safe accessing these waters and everything. Um, so the only the, what I found, I didn't find much if it was actually safe or not. But one thing I, I thought was interesting was with these water channels and with trade being so abundant during this time, um, it actually led to what was in my article, the emergence of the Sicilian pirates. So this was quite interesting, I thought, because um, a lot of research has been done on the Sicilian pirates, but actually they uh, under the Antiochus IV, the fourth so this was the same one that uh was kind of uh crushing religious tolerance and telling everyone that they had to enforce uh, uh worshiping greek gods so under this this same great leader <laughs> um he actually used these waterways and the sicilian pirates he formed an alliance with the sicilian pirates and used them to traffic in slaves to the empire so um, as horrible as that is, uh, they were not only able to channel goods, uh, but they also were able to travel uh, to channel workforce uh, into the country. So in forms of slaves. And this was this was his mechanism of creating and sustaining the economy and the food and everything. So, yeah, you mix. Uh, so, yeah, uh, to answer your question, uh, I'm not and I'm sure it was quite unsafe with the Sicilian pirates, uh, but during the time of Antiochus IV, I'd say probably since the pirates were aligned with him, they weren't so much concerned with stealing cargo and things from ships because they were actually in alliance with with the empire itself. So, so they had a they had a, a pirate buddy community. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, that essentially that's a fun hot take. That'll definitely be in the blurb. Um, <laughs> did you know anything more about the? I mean, obviously, that the trading that they did and the alliance was was quite horrendous by modern standards, but mm -hmm. that sustained the empire for a very mm -hmm. long time. Um, is, do you have more background on the Sicilian pirates? Uh, the Sicilian pirates. I I don't actually. I know that they were they were very big, like in in that area, because I remember like even just hearing the name Sicilian pirates. I mean, I, I've definitely heard of them before, um, and I, I've I, I know that I've come across their names in in books before. I know that they were 
they were good thieves. <laughs> um, but yeah, the only thing I know about them in relation to this is that, yeah, they just, I guess they took from stealing boats into instead they were they were great uh sailors i know so yeah they were using their sailing skills to then go and instead of stealing cargo off of ships now going to other places to actually traffic in slaves instead so i think probably for a little while under antiochus the fourth there is a bit of uh national uprisings because he was crushing uh all other types of religion but i think in the external front it was probably quite peaceful in the externally because he was actually keeping the pirates at on his side in a sense so yeah no, in interesting so from what I got in the article, um, leadership, at least at the upper levels, was passed down from father to son. And um, so that allowed, you know, Antio like, uh, and, you know, the king had, or the emperor had a lot of authority over the entire empire. But we also, you also write, wrote about a skilled bureaucracy within the empire. Um, what, how was it administered? What did politics look like within the empire uh, throughout its duration? Yeah, so... Yeah, because they had so much land mass and so many people to govern, they ended up having to make kind of um, an imperial like uh, province provinces, I guess. So they had provincial rule as in like each province could govern and rule their own system. And uh, they had two main cities. Actually, that's one of the things that the Seleucid Empire was really good at was building metropolis. So uh, they put a lot of money and uh, time into building metropolis. So they made two metropolis called Antioch. So after one of the sons and uh, Seleucia, uh, also after Seleucus. Um, so these two empires, they channel a lot of money in, and within all of those, they would have kind of the government institutions, I guess you could say. So they would basically have the, the empire, the emperor, whoever this was at the time, and uh, he would then extend his power out to the, the provinces and each province would have someone that was in charge of that province. And then underneath of them, they also had uh, clergy members. And uh, these people would kind of report from the provinces what's going on, what the people, how the people are feeling, what they need, the taxes, of course, the taxes were like super important for him to continue for for any of the leaders to continue their their empire um and even though the the king was the highest power he also he took a lot of counsel from his advisors so he was always aware of kind of what was going on in provinces that say were uh, hundreds of thousands of miles away um and uh, then he, they even had secretaries. So this was quite advanced for the time, um, having secretaries to also uh, disseminate information to the lo local governors of each of the provinces. So the local governors of the provinces were called satraps, satraps, I think. Um, yeah, and there was like, because of the cultural diversity of the empire, there was a big respect for provincial rule. Uh, people knew that they had a king and they didn't want to threaten the king, but at the same time, they also really respected the, the governors in power because those were the ones that would actually be aware of what the needs were in a, a territory that could have been as vast as half of Syria. So, I mean, these were massive land masses that had to cover. So it was important. And, and that was really modern at the time that he, that Seleucus and his uh, successors knew that they could not control such a vast territory with one person being in charge. They needed to have people underneath of them that were going to rule the provinces that were able to kind of go back to Seleucus in the end through secretaries and clergy members to kind of inform him of, of what's going on, if there's an uprising, what the people need, if people are not paying their taxes and all these things. So it was super important and what led to the longevity of the state because I mean, without the, without uh, acknowledging and being um, kind of accepting the, the pro provincial rule, uh, Seleucus would have never been able to calm uh, any, any stress that was happening in the nation, so. Very fascinating. The kind of dual 
political structures here. Uh, so mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing and writing about it. Um, as I love to end most calls, I want to talk about the food <laughs> and then we'll wrap up this call here. Um, it, it seems like you mentioned the goat cheese and olives and sort of the Mediterranean cuisine palate diet was, was uh, not founded by the Seleucids, but uh, widely shared and focused on. Um, but you also talk about moussaka and I, I want to jump in a little bit more. I don't know a whole lot about this food, but I have eaten it before and it's incredible. Um, and I'm just curious if you have even more culinary legacies of the Seleucid Empire. Sure. Yeah, so I had seen other other dishes that had Byzantine roots, which dates back to the Seleucid Empire. Um, I don't exactly remember. And to be honest, I've never tried moussaka. It sounds amazing, but I've never tried it. But um, in the Seleucid Empire, with just what uh, what they were able to grow um, in that region with the olives and the goat cheese, uh, you can kind of see uh, an eggplant and these kinds of these foods that were able to kind of grow really well there with the the land and the fertile lands and the river systems and the heat and everything. Those those typical foods from back then, you can still see them in like a lot of dishes, uh, in Mediterranean dishes as well. And there was a dessert as well that I'm not remembering what it's called, but there was a dessert as well that I found online that said it's uh, the ingredients that it used, because of course, it's hard to say for a civilization that lives in 312 BC to know exactly what their, how they made their desserts or whatever. Um, but they're just saying that a lot of the it's a lot of Byzantine inspired food now exists today in the Mediterranean based on the fact of how they cultivated and were able to uh, sustain their agriculture and everything during that time. Um, a lot of that now exists in this and as well um, with kind of staying on this kind of modern influence and everything other than food. Um, yeah, a lot of, because there was the Arab culture that was mixing with the Hellenistic Greek culture, um, there was a lot of word influences as well. So as I said before, uh, before the Greeks were quite the aristocracy, arist aristocratic uh, society. And so they passed this into the society and because of this, all of the, the names for, for medicines, for, for any diseases or injuries were all Greek inspired. And uh, now you'll actually see Greek inspired names that are within uh, Arab language within the Arab language. So that's quite interesting as well. And you also see like Arab influenced in, in Greek culture. So and as well, uh, the Greeks, for example, they were very much into playwriting and, and performing. And so this kind of also got passed down within the Seleucid Empire and, uh, and also keeping track of just historical documents and, and, and note taking and what was going on during during the time period. That was not an Arab tradition beforehand. And, and the, the, the Greeks, they brought this kind of theatrical aspect into the, the empire. And uh, this is still like passed down today. And um, yeah, it had a big influence on how history was even recorded, so. What a wonderful way to end. For, for those, please go eat moussaka mm -hmm. and all the other great foods you do and think about the Seleucids. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And for, for all listening, you can read even more details that we didn't talk about. So there's so much more to learn from the Seleucid Empire at our website, which is alfusaic.net. That's A-L-F-U-S-A-I-C dot N-E-T. Thanks all so much. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you.